Hi everybody, um, welcome to this webinar on climate activism in the time of COVID-19. Uh, I'm Juliet, I am IIED's events officer um, and this event forms part of our IIED debate series. Thanks very much Juliet and many thanks for all your work putting together this um, session with a really great panel. Um, so as Juliet mentioned, the, the topic for today, the question is what is the impact of COVID-19 and all the surrounding disruptions and lockdowns and so on on climate activism and also importantly um, what are the priorities where do we go from here um, to deal with this new environment radically new environment we're in so a set of really big questions what's the impact of losing the public space as an arena for protest um, is there a risk of losing momentum how do we build up towards COP26 happening in 2021 now. Um, what are the new entry points for climate action? And what are the pros also, as well as the cons of moving to digital spaces? Could it nurture new strategies um, and deepen alliances? And importantly, how does the current crisis change the agenda for climate action uh, for youth and in vulnerable countries and communities? Um, and finally, how does it change the goals? Does the huge shock of the pandemic um, create opportunities to rethink, um, opportunities for a transformational shock and a change to business as usual and create the space for the kind of radical action that we need to address the climate crisis? Um, and we've got a fantastic panel to address these issues. Um, and I will introduce them in a minute. But before that, I think Juliet is going to put up um, a poll question online, and if you could all answer that, um, I'll introduce the panel while you're doing that. So our first speaker will be Fahana Yamin, who's an internationally recognized climate lawyer, author, speaker, and social justice activist. It's great to have you with us, Fahana. Brilliant. Um, they, the other panelist, the second panelist will be Ineza Umahoma Grace, who is the founder and Chief Executive Officer of the Green Fighter, an impact-driven youth organization in Rwanda. She is a leader by example and involved in climate change diplomacy with a youth voice. And then next on your screen, although she will be the last speaker, is Vanessa Nakati. We're delighted to have you with us, Vanessa. Um, she was able to join us um, only in the last couple of days. We heard she was able to be here and we're really excited to have her with us. Vanessa is a climate activist in Uganda and founder of the Rise Up Climate Movement. And uh, the other panelist, delighted to introduce Sam Green um, from our IIED Climate Change Research Group. And Sam's research focuses on climate finance and climate change adaptation. So um, how are we doing with the poll, Juliet? Looking good. I'm going to share the results now. Uh, we've had about 70% uh, of people join, but here we go. Right. OK, so that's a really positive result. Has the pandemic situation compelled you to feel more or less active in the climate movement? And 74% are saying more and only 26% saying yes. So that's a great uh, position for us to kick off. And let me now go through the panel. Um, just addressing the broad issues as they want to pick out from the agenda, uh, the discussion agenda that we have today. So the first speaker is Fahana Yamin. Fahana, please go ahead. Okay, I just want to say thank you so much and um, fantastic to see so many panelists from around the world actually, you know, welcoming uh, uh, Vanessa and Inez when she joins as well. So we've really got to make the most of this uh, digital technology to ensure that we have as much inclusive global dialogue as possible about what is happening all around the world at this time uh, when the virtually the entire global economy is in some form of lockdown and shutdown um, uh, and is making a massive dent uh, in reducing emissions which from a climate perspective i guess no one can uh, be sorry about uh, but it's coming at a very high price in terms of uh, COVID-19, you know, very cruelly exposing the inequalities, the underlying inequalities and fragilities uh, that were present socially and economically in our system. 
so it's it's a it's not something that i feel uh we can celebrate you know uh in, in the way that some uh people i think in the environment movement initially kind of did that it's as I said, it's a cruel and, and sudden exposure, uh, especially for those people who are already bearing the brunt of uh, the impacts of many different uh, inequalities. Um, we're seeing that especially now as uh, COVID strikes uh, uh, and starts to peak in many developing countries, you know, how um, difficult that is where there are huge problems in terms of access to water to sanitation to health systems uh, and there where there, where there is a far fewer uh, uh, resilience uh, in the first place which is already being exacerbated by by, by climate change um, i think i've been asked to give a bigger picture view of what does um covid mean covid19 means for climate action um and as i said it's it's um in a way broken through and magnified and exposed some of the systemic problems that we had and some of those systemic problems uh, are very linked to and also part of the climate problem so for example i think the current health crisis is very much symptomatic of the wider crisis of climate change and the destruction of nature um, diseases such as ebola bird flu sars uh, you know originate in animals and they're being driven largely by the unsustainable exploitation of, of natural ecosystem and other co commodities all of these um, uh, diseases you know jumped and were exacerbated by the way in which our current food systems current agricultural systems impose a very high price in terms of the destruction of nature and the way in which we treat uh, 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 biodiversity and animal health. Um, secondly, I think this crisis has also shown how remarkably adaptive human beings are and how quickly they uh, rise to the challenge of dealing with their own care as well as the care of their loved ones and their wider family and that you know rapid change can happen very very quickly so there is huge sort of lessons to be learned and lots of positive uh, uh, energy to be gained from looking at how people are organizing now to care for their care for themselves care for their communities care for their families care for their neighborhoods um, and I think that that's something especially the climate community needs to learn more from. I think thirdly, um, you know, we have been emphasizing this uh, message for a while, but it hasn't broken through. It is the most vulnerable people who are being hit the hardest by COVID-19. And that's exactly the same underlying pattern that we see for climate change that social justice, climate justice are two sides of the same coin. And sometimes those who have contributed least, who are bearing the burden of existing uh, uh, social environmental damage uh, are also going to, and have been at the forefront of, um, of, of COVID-19 in this country, for example, and in the US and a number of countries is primarily the black and ethnic minorities who are uh, um, filling the wards actually, the ICUs and the hospitals uh, are filled with black and ethnic minority candidate uh, people who are, um, uh, you know, dying in the highest rates first actually. Um, in terms of um, what does this mean for climate action, as someone who's worked primarily in the climate uh, community and in the international part, you know, to be honest, climate activism, both the online aspects as well as uh, protest, uh, was uh, successful in delivering a huge number of laws. You know, there are 2000 laws all around the world. It was successful in delivering three different treaties with uh, hundreds of COP decisions. We've got the Climate Change Treaty in 92, the Kyoto Protocol 97, Paris Agreement 2015. But these collectively, uh, uh, these collectively were not delivering the, the protection of vulnerable communities uh, from climate impacts and they were putting us on a trajectory of three degrees of warming. So I, I think our existing activism before COVID struck was not, um, not able to deliver the change at scale that was needed. And I think what was wrong i suppose you know and is a prov provocation a little bit of a generalization was 
was frankly the climate movement was focusing on moments instead of movement building. It was focusing on year by year COPs or targets, uh, you know, that were periodic or companies, you know, getting companies to do X or Y, you know, what I call moment driven campaigning um, instead of systemic changes and not linking then with the political inequalities and the economic uh, structures that we needed to. So for a very long time, the mainstream environment movement focused on moments and focused on emissions and by and large built up its uh, campaigning and its frame outside and divorced from social movements that were challenging the underlying uh, uh, ecological, financial, economic system, which is driving the destruction in the first place. So I think, you know, last year, many of you know, um, uh, Andrew, do, do, do tell me if I'm rambling on. Last year, many of you know, this time last year, I was wearing this suit actually, um, and Extinction Rebellion, I became a, a rebel for much of last year and was very active in Extinction Rebellion and glued myself to the headquarters of Shell because I think the the, 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 the climate and environment movement had seen campaigning in terms of winning an argument. So it was a lot of money spent on framing, on media messaging, on communications. And that's great, but it hadn't appreciated or had underemphasized essentially political power. So it had not challenged sufficiently those who are wielding power in our economic system, those who are wielding power in our political systems, those who are using corruption, tax havens, who are using land grabs and so forth, and it had not made those links or underemphasized them in some way. And I feel that there is a massive positive uh, convergence of energies now in a more systemic approach uh, exemplified, for example, with the Green New Deal, exam exemplified now by uh, Fridays for Future campaigning for a much bigger, broader agenda of bringing in, you know, excluded, marginalised or unheard voices, youth voices, and, 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 and asking for systemic change instead of asking for piecemeal changes. So I hope that's a little bit of an overview of what um, I think can happen. My personal energy, just to finish off, is going into community-based forms of activism. So in Camden, we've uh, set up a, a Think and Do Centre, which is acting as a community hub, and which we hope will also continue to uh, bring the mutual aid groups, which are flourishing and are providing uh, actually uh, you know, community care and filling the gaps that the state cannot, cannot cover. And I feel that that's an under, underrepresented strand in the climate movement, which is, as I said, focused a little bit too much on the top down advocacy, elite communication uh, channels rather than on movement building and, and working in solidarity with peoples around the world engaged in social movements. Thank you. That's a fantastic introduction, Farhana. Many, many thanks. Um, I'm delighted to see that Inez has been able to join us. Um, took a while, I think, for you to get the technology up. But Inez, I'll, I'll, if it's OK, I'll, I'll go to you last so that you've got a bit of time to hear the discussion evolve as you joined uh, while Farhana was speaking. But it's great to have you with us. Um, Vanessa, would you like to go next? Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much. So when it comes to the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the climate crisis, um, as a climate activist, of course, uh, it worries me and it's not something that I can celebrate because people saying that the earth is rejuvenating and getting back to uh, its based form, I don't think it's something for us to celebrate simply because it involves the loss of people's lives. We shouldn't have to get back our earth to what it used to be while we sacrifice other people's lives. So I don't think it is something that we actually need to uh, praise or even thank the COVID-19 pandemic for because it has turned the world upside down and it has claimed very many, very many people's lives and also destroyed and torn apart different families, you know. So it is something that we can't be happy about. And it has clearly exposed, of course, the vulnerability of our communities, of our countries and the entire world at large. It has clearly showed that if a crisis really 
reaches its tipping point, its highest point, it affects everyone regardless of who you are, regardless of what your position is in society, regardless of the money you have. That is what this pandemic has shown us. And it clearly shows what we are to expect of the climate crisis. Now, when you look at the climate crisis, it affects currently it's it affects uh the least privileged communities the marginalized communities that is why we don't see so much attention when it comes to the governments uh, trying to solve it this is because it is not affecting those who have the power to stop it those who have the authority to stop it and those who have the resources to stop it but the covid 19 pandemic should teach our leaders that if they do not address a crisis at its earliest stage, then it becomes a problem once it escalates. That is what happened with the COVID-19 pandemic. It has short-term, uh, it has short-term effects. While the climate crisis, most of the effects seem to come uh, in a longer period of time, and this is what makes the leaders comfortable because they are not seeing these impacts daily, since they are living very comfortable lives. But then it is sad to note that there are those communities, marginalized communities, in uh, in different places, people who are suffering, people who depend on natural resources and that climate change is uh, affecting these resources, drying up their water sources. These people are, affecting, are being affected now. But the sad thing is that these people, most of them do not have a voice to talk about the problems that they face, to talk about the challenges that they face. And the other thing, even if they get the voice to speak for their problems, it is very hard for that voice to go out there. It is very hard for that voice to be amplified. It is a struggle to talk about the problems of the most affected communities. So how can we achieve climate justice if we are leaving out people who are being affected the most? Even in this crisis of the corona uh, pandemic, there are people who are suffering right now. I'll give an example. In East Africa, we've had Lake Victoria water levels rising up and uh, around 32,000 people were displaced in Kenya. Imagine being displaced and losing your home at a period where they're telling us to stay at home. You know, Imagine losing your farms. It is the same thing happening in Uganda as well. It is the same thing happening in Rwanda as well the rivers are bursting and causing flooding in all those areas but we are not seeing these things reach the news and if they don't reach the news who will care who will care to talk about these problems who will care to find the solutions to these problems even those who are trying to build resilience in these communities they are finding it so hard to even acquire the resources to build the resilience in their communities so there is a very strong uh, imbalance when it comes to addressing these problems addressing uh, the crisis of climate change and um, the other thing I would talk about the COVID-19 pandemic, it has shown that the leaders are capable of listening to the science, that's if the crisis affects them. Because when they realize that this crisis is not uh, specific to a certain group of people, they were quick to make decisions, to uh, lock down their countries, to you know, uh, lock down the airports and just close any kind of uh, activities in their countries simply because they know they can also be affected by the virus. So it showed us that if they know that they are in danger, they are capable of taking action. So meaning that they are capable of listening to the science of the climate crisis, they just don't want to since they have not been able to experience those impacts. But how shall we make sure that these leaders understand the pain of the suffering communities, if even the voices in those communities are not being listened to, you realize that most of those communities are the least emitters of carbons. But then they even never get to talk to the leaders. We just need some voices from uh, the global south to face an European parliament, for example, and clearly tell them what is happening. They need to hear these voices from the, from the root 
you know, from the root communities, from the grassroots, they need to listen to these voices from the communities that are affected the most. That is the beginning of environmental justice. And we cannot have climate justice without environmental justice because environmental justice begins with us amplifying the most affected communities and bringing solutions to these communities. And also the COVID-19 pandemic has also showed that the leaders are capable, you know, they have the resources to address a crisis if they want to. So all they need is the will to address the problem of climate change. The moment they will, they have the capacity to, they have the money, they have the resources. But how shall we make them understand that climate change can affect them as well? regardless of the houses they live in, regardless of the buildings that they have at the end of the day, the moment climate change reaches its tipping point, it is going to affect all of us. But we would have sacrificed very, very many people. So we need to address it now to stop the suffering of the people in the most vulnerable communities, the people who breathe a different kind of air than what the leaders breathe. So we need to address that. And we also see that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, it really affects the respiratory organs. But I must address something that climate change has affected very many people's respiratory systems through air pollution. But we haven't seen these things come up. Why? Because still it is the, the less privileged workers, it is the less privileged communities that experience these problems. Vanessa, thank you very much indeed. That was fantastic. Um, I want to also give a bit of time at the end for you to respond to questions. So we'll carry on around the panel, but incredibly eloquent and really, really fantastic contribution. Thank you so much. Let me uh, go to Ineza now. Uh, Ineza, it looked like you had some trouble joining, but really glad to have you with us now. Um, so please go ahead. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry I was a little bit late. I was having um, trouble with the connection. Um, so, talking about the COVID-19 pandemic in the from the perspective of uh, a young activist, but also an impact driver on the ground, um, I can say that this pandemic is just uh, um, having different. Um, it's, it's, a, it's affecting on two on two sides, uh, side effects or side areas. Um, for example, it teaches uh, we activists that uh, we also have to raise the voice using uh, online platforms such as Twitter, um, websites, just to make sure that enough people or the community is listening or what we have to say. And one of the challenges we are facing is, is that uh, when you, you raise voice in that, in that area, uh, when you use uh, internet connection, you find that uh, the community you are targeting is not connected. That's one, which means uh, you, you are making the voice, but, but the people with whom you really want to make them understand that the, they, are re, they are understood, that their, uh, their question is, uh, or their struggles are not indifferent for some of the people uh they are not they are not understanding us that's one and also from from the side of making impact because now we we cannot drive on, on ground activities which uh which from one sense is kind of uh highly important for us the youth because uh we cannot make big projects uh such as on a national level but we still rely on those small activity that we used to have that was uh targeting increasing the knowledge of the community uh, or making uh, eradicate the environmental knowledge gap but in these days we are not able to make them so it's kind of it's kind of challenging because we are facing the fact that when the pandemic will be over uh, much more of our activities that was already in, in progress will be drawn back so we'll be having to start again from zero because what uh, much of the impact that we already made is kind of being lost somehow because now uh, the, the people in general are trying to learn in a, in a new area or a new uh, manner. Also, um, adding to what Vanessa talked about that uh, this pandemic just kind of opened the eyes of everyone, uh, especially the eyes of the leaders in trying to uh, acknowledge that uh, these uh, 
the scientific data are not are not uh, something made up it's something real so i think that this is a time that most of the people will understand that the the scientific data from the ipcc regarding climate change regarding how how much the community is vulnerable now they'll be much more understood because they kind of they are kind of now living in a, in a way we can feel like what will happen when the climate crisis will be at, at, the, at the peak. So, um, and also I think now, now more than ever, uh, everyone is willing to, to come together as, as one. Uh, for, for, for example, um, we, are, we, are, we are wanting to come together as one so that we can stay safe from the COVID, which means that people are now willing to understand what the government is saying. Uh, so I see there, there is a hope that after these people will be also more eager to understand some of uh, the environmental protection strat status or strategies that will be set out because now, now more than ever we understand that we have a common earth and uh, a common air around us. Fantastic. Thanks very much indeed, Ineza. Um, I mean, there's some really great points from all the panelists. Let me go to Sam now for the, the final panelist contribution and then we'll move to Q&A. We've got some great questions already coming up, so I want to make sure we have time for that. And please use the Q&A box if you do have questions rather than the chat um, or the raise hand function if you're familiar with that. Sam. Thanks, Andy, and uh, thank you to the rest of the panelists for some, some really great points. So I'm going to try not to repeat, and maybe try and offer a slightly uh, different emphasis. Um, the, the first is that uh, good activism depends on really great research uh, to have the right argument to be able to, to frame uh, uh, the movement of people around uh, key ideas or key narratives. So I think one of the big challenges that the pandemic is raising is it's really difficult for us to do that research in an effective way. Certainly from an adaptation standpoint, there are some really tough questions that we don't really have the answers to, like how do we ensure that women or young people or other marginalized groups are uh, 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 properly able to benefit from climate adaptation investment? Or uh, how do we even enable climate finance to flow at scale to where it's supposed to get to it, uh, where the most vulnerable people are? And we don't really have the answers to these questions and the research that's needed for that requires bringing people together, sharing perspectives, dialogue and that's best done in person so i think for me there is a concern certainly from a research perspective of how we keep in current uh, and, and enabling that shared uh, discussion decision making that's really important in informing i know farhana said we shouldn't focus on those moments but uh, they do they do matter uh, how do we use our research to inform those uh, at those at key times whilst also building on the momentum from uh, uh, social movements? So that also brings me on to the next issue, and I'm, and I'm really happy that that's come up, is uh, the role of social movements, either uh, disruption or, or, or in solidarity. So I think that, that COVID-19 has really highlighted uh, how our society responds in a crisis and what's important. It's really clear all of a sudden that public goods are essential in a crisis. Um, public health in this case, but I would argue that the same is absolutely true um, uh, for responding to climate risks, and that's either here uh, uh, or in the most vulnerable communities in the global south. And it is social movements who seemed particularly to be having a moment in 2019 who were highlighting those injustices really effectively. Um, uh, uh, and so, whereas before they were very much on a disruptive footing, it seems like now, rather than losing momentum, they've, they've, they've taken a moment to build, uh, uh, to, to, to stop and regroup and build solidarity. So I can speak to my own mutual aid group in Kilburn is bringing people together to talk about things like domestic violence and the way that the council functions in ways that haven't really happened before and bringing uh, unusual groups together. Um, and I think that's really interesting. I also think that those social movements, whether that's here or particularly overseas, movements like Slum and Shack Dwellers International or the Waste Pickers Alliance, 
they have a tremendous network uh, and, and the ability to teach us what's really happening on the ground. Uh, the lived experience uh, uh, articulated from the perspectives of those people. And I'm sure if somebody asked my mutual aid group to articulate some of the challenges, we could do that in a way that maybe uh, a cold survey or a mobile phone survey couldn't do. So uh, we, I think, as climate activists and climate researchers, have a tremendous amount to learn from social movements across the global south. Uh, and what we need to think about going forward is how do we uh, uh, support them to uh, articulate that knowledge clearly, to uh, gather that knowledge more effectively, uh, and to share their own understanding of the challenges of how we respond to crisis. Um, and we can transfer that learning from the pandemic to uh, uh, the climate crisis. Uh, finally, also just on something interesting about what the agenda is going forward, I think it's really positive to see a bouncing back better agenda emerging that seems to be better at tying climate, uh, climate risks or pandemic risks to the way we structure our economic system. Um, the, the pandemic is making us realize how vulnerable our systems are, how, how, uh, how lacking in resilience uh, we are even globally to unexpected uh, crises. But uh, I think that what, we, what needs to be incorporated into, incorporated into that agenda is not just emissions reductions, but also recognizing that failure to prepare for a crisis is not an accident. It's a political failing. This is a point made by, uh, uh, by Claire, uh, uh, Claire Sackier, our uh, climate change group director, a few weeks ago. Is failing to prepare for a crisis that you had warning on of is a political failing. And we need to build that into our narrative. Uh, and I guess finally, just to make the point that, that whilst this is a tragedy, uh, there's an opportunity here to, to, to have a more positive narrative. I think uh, uh, environmentalists and climate campaigners have often been seen as bringing people, telling people what they can't have. There was a moment where Andrew Bolton said exactly that to, to Rupert Reid in Extinction Rebellion uh, on the news about a year and a half ago. And there's an opportunity here not to talk about what we have to have less of, but how we can create a more just and equitable future that, that offers us a resilient society uh, for the future uh, and addresses the, the vulnerabilities that make uh, our development as a global society uh, slower and more difficult. So uh, I think there are, that there are some opportunities there that, that we uh, need to incorporate into our climate narratives as well. Uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much to all of you. Um, great contributions. Um, I think we've got another couple of polls that Juliet's going to put up at this point while I just uh, speak quickly before we go to the question. So yeah, there you got two. One question, the lack of street activism could set us back in terms of getting a good outcome from COP26, yes or no. Um, online activism could nurture new strategies for engaging people. So let me just reflect a little bit before we go. We've got some great questions coming in. Um, Fahana, really eloquent, um, talking about movements, not moments, and the need to address structural issues of political power um, in the way that we go forward um, with climate activism and the, and the crisis. Um, Vanessa was really on point with just the lessons of the importance of acting early. Um, and that, that links to what Sam was also saying, that there was notice of this thing, of the coronavirus crisis. There were plenty of warnings and failing to prepare is a political failing, whether it's the climate crisis or the pandemic. Um, and also Vanessa spoke really uh, eloquently about the need to to see the realities of the lived experience in the global south on a global scale. And I know there are many people trying to put that through, but cutting through the noise in the north um, is not simple in terms of global media. And Inaza spoke about the opportunity to work online to build global solidarity, but also this other message that comes from the pandemic, that it's important to listen to the science and can we kind of build on that. And finally from Sam, a lot of great points there. How can we use this for a transformational dynamic to build back better, to change our view of economics and that these issues, justice, equity, resilience, climate action, all go together. So have we got, um, Juliet, have we got the results on the polls? 
So again, um, fairly positive results there. Um, the lack of street activism could set us back in terms of um, what happens at the next COP. That's one of the moments. So maybe Fahada would say the movement more important than the moment there. But we, we do have people seeing that that could be an issue in terms of what we get out of COP26. So that's more a question or a negative response there that we may not get the progress that we would have had if we'd had street protest. But on the second one, a very positive result, online activism could nurture new strategies for engaging people in climate action. And that's a massive yes, 95%. So thanks very much for those. Um, let's now go to the Q&A. Yeah, I'm happy to answer, well, there were a couple in the chat box as well about COP26, which some people yeah. I think would be interested in. And I, I guess, because I've been involved in a lot of COPs, you know, including many IID colleagues here, so, so I think, you know, this build up every five years, you know, which is what Paris is based on, also Kyoto was based on, every five years we have the science reports from the IPCC, we tie it uh, in with the political electoral cycle, which in most countries is four years, five, five years, you know, is, is sometimes it's hugely distracting and has stopped the underlying work because what happens is negotiators and governments then hold back you know the negotiating process itself you know means that they hold back what they would otherwise do and give because of the bargaining you know nature and it sounds silly but you know they they don't give their aid you know they'll say oh we're going to deliver this as our big moment you know uh, at the next un summit or at the next this or we're going to hold back this chip because you know we're going to get the developing countries to concede on loss and damage you know, what, what does it mean? You know, this is what I hear and I've heard for 25 years and it's frustrated me. They actually hold back and, you know, each country does this a little bit, but by and large, the money, the political will and the, 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 the Trump cards are in the hands, you know, it's a bad pun, but it's very true, of the richer countries. So they hold back and take issues as hostage to, to get progress on their terms. And the fact is that, you know, the most important thing to know about COP26 is loss and damage isn't even on the agenda. It's not on the agenda because the way in which it, the agendas and everything was, was structured a few years ago as a result of these terrible negotiating compromises that all of us have to engage in when we're advisors to small island states and vulnerable countries. So I have a huge level of frustration and disappointment with the way in which, you know, these big moments now work. There's also um, absolutely support what you know, Sam has said about the need for research and brilliant and important research. But the truth is that you know, the research organizations and the elite advocacy organizations and those close to them doing comms for them have taken a lion's share of the budget of philanthropy and donors and governments for a very long time. And it's left peanuts for movement building and Southern based and new NGOs. And that is one of the reasons why, for example, Extinction Rebellion came from nowhere with peanuts money, actually, uh, including a, a little bit from foundations in the end, very reluctantly. But actually, the real breakthrough has come, you know, at times in the recent years from people who are not funded uh, uh, um, and supported by uh, traditional charitable research based organizations who cannot go outside of their mandates, cannot do political work, cannot certainly say things like the system is broken or actually our research is shown that all time and time again you know we should do less and more money should be given to other people so i, I feel like those things have been shown uh, time and time again you know to to be important factors and i'm fed up of the cop you know people going now 20,000 30,000 it's a great metric but what do those 20 30,000 people do there you know, the bulk of the COP is about government negotiations and the governments have not been delivering the rules that they said that they would deliver. And at any one point, it's only about a thousand people that are really directly involved in those negotiations who need to physically see each other and be present. Uh, and the other, I'm sorry, 29,000 often spend a lot of money, you know, on side events, on uh, activities. Sometimes they go for one side event which is two hours long shared with 10 other people. And that's the bulk of the airfares, travel, accommodation, 
the networking part is fantastic and important. So some of these things really need to be re-examined, especially now going forward and whether the, the COP that is now possible should be this big jangly, you know, involve 30,000 and let's for the timing to be right, or should it focus on what the government's already promised and are legally obliged to deliver, which is their NDCs that they haven't yet tabled in uh, detail, um, especially the bigger emitters who are stepping back and were stepping back before COVID arrived, and what the uh, uh, online pressuring points are then for the bulk of those uh, groups that have big budgets to organise around these cops. They get get millions of uh, pounds, dollars, and uh, you know to to organise mobilisation efforts around it. And most of that is very top heavy and is not going on the kind of support and mobilisation that is actually needed in the rest of the world. So I, I've become quite critical. I know Salim al Haq and I, you know, from our IAD, we've been writing a little bit on that. Um, the developing countries have pioneered virtual summits. So with the Climate Vulnerable Forum countries, a grouping of about 48 people, we had a Google hosted virtual summit in November 2018 you know, and it worked pretty well. The technology's improved yet further. There was a yet another online uh, forum convened by EOSIS with the support of the UK government uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. There are many, many better ways of, of organizing the kind of rule delivery and the implementation and the accountability and then transparency that is needed than just having, you know, 20,000, 30,000 people turn up at a COP with governments then holding back what they needed to deliver ahead of that time and it's become a very difficult process actually to to get progress around so yeah yeah that, those are a couple of the points that came addressed to me and i think we need to think much more creatively about that and the you know covid and this seminar here provides us with an opportunity to test what those could look like what those spaces networking events zoom uh, uh, you know side events could look like you know instead of uh, flying all around the world for you know, the, the large part for a very sociable set of activities. Thanks very much, Fahana. Really well made points. And we hope that when we get to the end, let's talk a bit about the way forward in the way that you were, you were indicating as well. Vanessa, there's um, several points. I haven't been through all of them, but several people, um, James, uh, Jenison, Kara, asking, um, what is the best way that northern or European climate activists can ensure um, that most, the most marginalised in the global south have their voices amplified in relation to climate action and the climate crisis? So Vanessa, could you just offer us some thoughts on that and indeed anything else you've seen in the questions that you want to pick up? Uh, well, uh, for that question, I would say that um, the activists in the north have really They've really been doing uh, great work to help out the activists in the South. I have experienced that as well, and uh, including them in digital actions and also some of the events. But I think it's more like a system that was already built that shows some sort of white privilege. And that is what affects the, the activists from the global south the most. But uh, for the activists from the north, they, they, are, they are really so helpful. Personally, they have been very helpful in my activism and helping me out and sharing the work that I'm doing and also taking part in the digital actions that we organize. So I think that they should just continue doing what they have already been doing. And then also um, we can have uh, media, media being more inclusive as well, and sharing and interviewing these activists because there are so many from, from the Global South and get to know what they're doing in their communities and get to understand why they became activists and why it's important for them to see that the issue of climate change is addressed in their communities. You know, every activist has a story to tell and every story has a solution to give and every solution has a life to change. So media needs to be more inclusive to give an opportunity to these activists to talk about what is happening in their communities because they alone understand what is really going on since they face the direct impacts of climate change and then i can also talk about the the ngos uh, they can try to be more um, 
to balance the number of activists because sometimes you see them are uh, inviting activists for maybe online events or even uh, physical events and sometimes you get there and the number is really the ratio is so so disturbing if it's white to uh, to black, it will be five to maybe two. So you find that the representation from these communities that are affected the most is so little. So I think NGOs need to do something about that, not to just select one person or from the African continent and have maybe uh, more people from European countries, there is an imbalance there. So they should do more in making sure that they try to balance up the numbers so that we as activists from the Global South do not feel left out and do not feel out of place when we get there. So I think basically uh, those are the things that, that we can do to make sure that the stories of these activists are amplified and they get to, uh, you know, to give solutions and to find solutions for their communities. And then also we need more voices uh, speaking directly to the leaders who are in charge. You know, yes, we have all these negotiations, but at the end of the day, there are countries that make the final decisions. There are countries that do the funding. So we need voices from the Global South to speak directly to the leaders of these countries, to the parliaments of these countries, because many of them are comfortable and not taking the necessary action or even delaying the action because they, they are not facing these impacts. And yet these are the communities communities on the other side of the world, they are facing the impacts. So we need to balance also the representation when it comes to addressing these Western parliaments, because at some point they need to be held accountable and they need to understand all the problems or the mess that the people in the global south are going through because of uh, the actions that some of them took and they need to understand that the action we need is urgent and not uh, maybe in 20 years or 50 years because how many people would have died in that period of time? So that's basically the message for the activists to keep doing what they have been doing, for NGOs to be more inclusive in the, in the, what, in the activists that they invite for their digital events or physical in-person events and also for them to try as much as for media to also be inclusive and to have more voices addressing these leaders who at the end of the day make the decisions that define our destinies. Fantastic, thanks very much, Vanessa. Um, and yeah, I mean, we need all of us, that's a responsibility I think for all of us working in this space to take on board, but thanks for making those points so eloquently. Inez, there's a question I was wondering if you'd like to take up about people were very positive about online engagement. 95% of people said, yes, this can strengthen us. Do you have any thoughts about how that needs to be shaped to be effective? The connection should be much more inclusive and trying to reach uh, especially each community under its specific needs because what is needed in the in Rwanda, for example, it's not the same as what is needed in Uganda, but it, we, I think if we can have um, a, a strategy that can be much more inclusive of uh, all the community, that would be amazing. And uh, also as, as if uh, the media should also capture because the, all the local media already has um, its ways of reaching all the community uh, at large. So if they can be uh, included in making uh, the voice in, in raising the voice that, that would be much more helpful and it would be offering a, a strategy which would be which would be based on improving what was already being done on the in the community great thanks and is there a job to be done also on digital inequality on ensuring that um the possibility that the technical possibility and the engagement is there for um for a genuinely equitable online action yes exactly um because if we are, we are targeting to um to raise up with one voice and one spirit against uh, this the climate issues we really need to be um we really need to be to incorporate much more of uh, every every voice because as vanessa say every voice counts 
and every voice can be a source of solving one one people's lives. So they should be there should be much more um, an approach that is really comfortable with everyone, an approach that uh, it's uh, it's offering um, a way to be um, to be much more free in expressing what you really what you want to say. Uh, with uh, when you are practically sure that the people the people you are talking to will listen and uh, convey your message to the right community. Great, thanks very much indeed, Inaza. Um, Great questions. Sam, is there anything you want to pick up at this point? Maybe I think just to add, I mean, I absolutely agree uh, with Farhana's point about the COP having organized a side event. There's no opportunity to fle for flexibility. It is a, we have a project, look how great it is. And then you hope some people turn up. Um, I do think that if, I, if movements were stronger, the COP could take on a, a different uh, emphasis. Um, uh, uh, and I think as Salim has, has said in the past, focusing more on the, on the discussion and the problem solving and the interactions between people uh, uh, rather than the, the, the sort of hallowed and restricted turf in which the government advisors uh, sit in and negotiate in. Um, I'd also uh, just uh, agree that we do need to think about how the big NGOs can get out of the way a little bit to sort of take a supportive stance. Um, the, the big NGOs have built themselves a momentum and they need to start thinking about step by step, thinking of a plan to move the momentum away from continuing what they're already doing and shifting it to providing support to where capacity support is needed or funding support is needed in the most vulnerable uh, uh, places. I think that's really important. Um, I also think that that going forward, one of the things we, we really need to focus on is governance of um, resources and governance of public services. I think transparency and accountability are key and we need to find uh, more opportunities to integrate the public into the everyday uh, decision making and governance that takes place and, and thinking about the future. I, I think XR is, is really onto something with pushing the idea of uh, the, the deliberative democracy idea, the citizens assemblies. And there are regions in the world where, you know, there are parts of Canada where one in 60 people have, have engaged in some form of deliberative democracy. Um, it is something that we do need to build into public discourse. And I think in doing that, we can create ownership of the difficult choices that need to be made in shifting our economies to something to the, that's more resilient. Um, but that is rooted in a serious conversation about what are the mechanisms for enabling that? How do we hold uh, uh, power accountable in a more effective way? Um, right. Yeah. Thanks very much, Sam. I want to go into that space a little bit with the other panelists as well and the kinds of things you were talking about. What one or two big priorities going forward from this point? Um, just to wrap up, because we've just got about five minutes left. So, um, again, let me go to Fahana first. One, one or two big things that the climate activism should focus on now, given this huge global shock and the, the changed world we're looking at. Yeah, I, I, would, um, I would say absolutely build the density, vibrancy, resilience of local networks. Essentially, we were really good at the top-down global diplomacy. Let's congratulate ourselves and not be ourselves too much around the head for that. But what's missing is the mycelium, the roots, the networks that need connecting. As, as we've seen, you know, that top-down structure is, is brilliant, but it doesn't function well unless it has strong roots. And those are built by community-based forms of actions. And that's where I've put my energy and time, actually all of sort of last year. And the Think and Do example came from and is part of that deliberative democracy of returning decision-making and accountability to more localized forms uh, without you know, uh, invoking the sort of nationalism and exclusionary stuff, but inclusive democratic reform is what's needed and you know turning on its head this extractive model where largely our economy is based on private profits returned to shareholders in far away places you know you know many many times you know offshore tax havens in many other countries that absolutely don't give 
don't give a two figs about what's happening to the local communities. And all around the world, people are, are, are against that kind of economic extractive model, whether they're voting, frankly, for uh, what, what we see as populist, nationalist, right-wing leaders, or otherwise, they are united against saying that that kind of uh, non-localized, non-community-based form of uh, an extractive economy is wrong. And that's why we should all pile in now and support that mycelium, the tap roots, which is essentially the community piece, uh, and, and work with your local councils, your local mutual aid groups, and, and get in there. Um, and too many of us, myself included, you know, a lot of our identity is around, you know, going to these cops and saying, I'm a global player, and, you know, I, I do this. And actually, community-based forms of activism and work do not get the kind of glamour, the kind of money, the kind of support, and that's the big missing piece right now that we can help unite COVID and climate action and, and unite face-to-face -face personalised connections with where we live, who we see, who we support with the global dynamics that are, are needed to rectify at this point. Thanks very much, Fahana. That's great. Ineza, what would be your one or two big priorities right now? Um, for me, uh, right now, what, um, what, what, what I can say as the big priority is uh, the fact to uh, recognize and support some of uh, the on-ground solution-making youth organizations, such as the Green Fighter, that are, that are already existing, try to make an impact. So, uh, as we, we really need to increase um, action and uh, ambition for each country, and there's a dormant, a dormant opportunity in mostly the youth, the youth uh, engagement, youth uh, actions. Um, I think it can be the, great, uh, the good starting point um, in trying to come up from this, uh, from this pandemic with a new strategy, uh, a strategy that, that is much more uh, impact-based, but not much more of uh, word-based. Because uh, for, for very past years, we, we experienced some of the decision uh, we are having a COP, we have a decision, but for the next COP, we found that the, the, the decision was only a draft text. There's nothing much more miserable of what was happening after. Uh, but we really have a chance that uh, the youth, uh, especially from the Global South, uh, that are already willing to capture some of the, the ambition, some of the, uh, the, uh, the action that the countries want to undertake and try to make them on, uh, on their own level. So what is needed is, I think, is to come up with the strategy that um, all of us we are we are on the same boat and try to make make much more noise in making impact on, in our community. Thank you so much, Ineza. Um, so also supporting uh, grassroots organisations, but looking for that transformational moment um, coming out of. Um, we don't know how we come out of this crisis, but as we as we do. So, Vanessa, the, let me give you the last word. What would be your one big priority to go forward at this point? Yeah, um, I think that as an activist and uh, what I would expect from any other activist is to continue with the same momentum or even more than what they had before this pandemic. Because, yes, uh, we, people are saying that the earth is rejuvenating and all that, but remember, after the pandemic, our governments, their economies are going into recess. They are doing so bad right now. So we worry about what is going to come after this pandemic. Many of them are going to try to get back to the top at whatever cost. We are going to see oil and gas companies being bailed out. We are going to see more industries running and we'll go back to even to what, to where we were or even to our worst situation. So we as activists, this is the time for us to build more momentum online as we await the post-COVID uh, situation because now we have to speak out more. Now we have to be more clear about the demands we make so that our governments push for a green recovery and not just a recovery that, uh, that puts the lives of the people at risk and also our planet at risk. And then... Uh, the other thing that I would talk about is uh, what Ineza said about the supporting grassroots, uh, uh, maybe 
projects or uh, activities that are being done to build resilience. You know, I have experienced this a lot. You find that uh, you do so many interviews, you speak at so many events, and all they do is they ask you about the project that you're doing, but they never get to say that we would like to help you, we would like to, you know, do something to make that project even more further. So I think that really needs to change. I remember being, I mean, a I mean, many, many groups with other activists. So I remember specific activists from Europe saying that they had over uh, 500,000 euros on their donation account. And this is not something that we see when it comes to the global south. And yet there are many activists who are taking uh, those projects that are building resilience in those communities. So I think uh, we need to address the issue of climate finance because we cannot leave out some communities while uh, helping out others and especially leaving out those who are most you know most affected and they clearly explained that they really didn't know what they were going to use the money for but it was just there on the account for the for their climate group and uh it was really disturbing to see that many, many people have done many interviews, but they always just ask, what project are you doing? But they never go on to say, how can we help? How can we pitch in? How can we make that project move across your country, Uganda, and maybe go to Rwanda, Kenya, and any other African countries? So this, uh, the issue of climate finance really needs to be checked a bit. There is a lot that is lacking. Thank you. I think we're out of time now. So um, first of all, huge thanks to the panel. Um, huge thanks to Fahana for um, giving us such a, a breadth of vision and all of your many years of experience working at the international level and contrasting that now with your, the grassroots focus of your work. It was just brilliant to hear that. Um, huge thanks to Sam for bringing the perspective of someone working the organization I head for IIED um, and we try in our own way to deal with some of these other issues the questions of voice and support to organizations in the global south which um, through climate finance and others huge thanks also um, to the two youth activists who joined us um, Ineza from Rwanda um, Ineza many thanks you were really eloquent and it was just great to hear your perspective and we look forward to being in touch with you as we go forward. And finally, Vanessa, we heard from you at the last minute, but we're so delighted you could join us and it was just brilliant to have your voice on this webinar and again, look forward to being in touch with you in future. Um, we've had tons of stuff coming in on the chat box on the questions that um, I haven't been able to get to. It was just too much. So sorry to um if for anyone i missed their question or their chat apologies but we'll do our best we've got all this recorded and we'll do our best to think about how we put all this together all the various requests also that we've had in from people for sharing contacts and so on we'll look at that do what we can to follow up as strongly as we can but also we'll be talking to the people on this um the fantastic panel we had today but also others about how we take this conversation going forward in the future.